to come. We are now being recorded and I will wait a moment for the Facebook people to join us and then we will officially begin. A little more slug of caffeine. <laughs> Tim says, open the history portal, Hal. Oh, there. Okay. We are now on Facebook. That was a good introduction to Facebook. Okay. Wonderful. Hello to everybody uh, and welcome, as always, to History Batters and so does Coffee, although I will confess, because I'm always like stupidly truthful about it, everything here, you know, and I shouldn't be, I'm drinking green tea. Green tea again today. I know, because I didn't have time to make coffee, <laughs> which is the absolute truth. I was like, ah, <laughs> quick, tea bag, microwave. Okay. <laughs> so today, um, as advertised on Twitter, we're going to be talking about um, when history really matters, but also as always, uh, before we plunge into our topic for this week, I must turn to my partner in crime, Matt, who will explain the rules of the game. Well, if you don't have it down by now, 90 episodes in. <laughs> man, oh man. For Talk the last about. time, I will say that, um, as always, we encourage you to use chat. Please uh, put in your comments. We do love it. Uh, love hearing from you and seeing you. And uh, But as always, try to keep it uh, germane to the conversation and, of course, family friendly. If you do have questions for Joanne, please put them in the Q&A. That's a lot easier than scrolling through chat and because I invariably will miss something. So please put it in Q&A. Um, and so, yes, please put in lots of questions. You all have been amazing with questions late, lately. And this is the part that we- Always do. amazing with questions. They are always amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But you, uh, so put them in because, you know, it's all about you. It really is. So, um, <laughs> And that's all I have. I think those are the rules of the game. So we're looking forward to a great episode. Okay, excellent. There we are. Okay, so, oh, go ahead, Grace. A quick note, I, I'm Grace Leatherman. I'm the executive director of the National Council for History Education. So I did just want to say while we are live on, on Facebook and recording that uh, this 90th episode is Matt Messias's last episode. So we did just want to thank him on behalf of NCHE for the incredible service he has given to this community, this history community. So. Thank you for that. And there will be an after party afterward for those who wish to celebrate him. Thank you, Matt. Okay, more to come. Uh, okay, sorry to uh, cut you off there, Grace. I'm like on my normal roll. Um, okay, so um, today's topic as advertised um, on Twitter was when history really matters. Uh, I, I, I was away thinking about this topic and I was very proud of the fact that I thought about it. I came up with it on Wednesday, which as those of you who come every week know, is really good for me. Uh, and there'll be several explanations for why I chose this topic. I'll give you some of them now and one of them later. For now, I'll mention two things that made it seem particularly appropriate right now. And one is a really obvious one. Um, and that is just the ongoing attack on the teaching of history, which, you know, in one way or another can always be political or politicized, but right now uh, in obvious ways, for obvious reasons, is particularly politicized and is the politicization of it is not seemingly going away anytime soon. Um, so it's always important to discuss why history matters and when history matters. And I can't I actually, um, um, I can't see what people are saying, um, so I don't remember if it's the 89th or 90th episode, um, whichever it is, uh, for 89 or 90 weeks, we've been talking about how and why history matters. So number one, just the, the current war against the teaching of history in its full complexity. Number two, and this also has been an ongoing theme of history matters, is the ongoing importance of understanding how we got to where we are, which sounds really obvious, right? To understand the present, you need to understand the past and past events and how we got here. But I think it isn't always obvious to everyone at all times. And particularly now, and I'm probably gonna use this word a lot in this episode. So 
I got to assume contingency is on the bingo card. If those of you here who are here who are new, there is an ongoing bingo game that happens every week. Um, and uh, usually contingency is on the card. Today, that's a good day. Um, so yes, I will be talking about contingency because in times of extreme contingency, and I'll go back to that in a moment too, it, you really need guidance of any kind that you can find and history can help. Um, not surprisingly, things that don't help. Pretending that things that happened didn't, ignoring things that happened, both of those things are going to be problematic for understanding the here and now. And anyone who understands history, likes history, has a vague interest in history. Anyone who understands what history is, of course, and Newby just gave a very strong chirp of approval, um, understands the, the vital significance generally of understanding the background of how we get here. Uh, and particularly now when we really don't know day to day, week to week, uh, sort of where we're headed next. Um, an example of, of my explaining this to someone and, and realizing it needed to be explained was um, at some, I can't remember when, it was before um, Biden took office and I was doing an interview and um, the reporter said something like, it might've been during Trump's presidency. The reporter said, why is it important for a president to know history? And they weren't trying to be provocative. They actually wanted to know, like, why, why does a president need to know history? And, and this was the answer I came up with, for better or worse. Um, but I think it kind of makes the point I'm making right now. I said, okay, so imagine that you have just been made CEO of a big, prominent company. Would you want to be in charge of that company without any sense of where it started, how it developed, who had been in power, who had been out of power, everything that happened before you got there. Wouldn't you, if you were going to be an informed person leading that company, want to have a sense of its history? And the reporter, and, and I actually can't, uh, I don't remember who the reporter was, so I don't remember the paper it was from, but whoever it was kind of went, oh. <laughs> now, I, you know, as a historian, of course, I'm biased, but my thought was, what do you mean? Why does a president need history? But, but that felt to me like a pretty basic um, utilitarian explanation, right? If you want to understand where you are, you need to know how you got there. History. Um, now, I mentioned in my tweet, and it is what I want to start off with today, the founding generation had a really um, distinctive sense of history that shaped the way they thought about things. Um, particularly, this is true of the politically minded. And I know I've talked about this before, that um, the Enlightenment and its uh, influence on thinking, the idea of, of the Enlightenment, among other things, was that there are patterns, sort of universal patterns, uh, that if you study, uh, and science is helpful in this, that you can find these sort of patterns across time and understand them and then really better understand the universe and history, right? So, the, so an enlightenment thinker is looking for those patterns to try and help understand the present better by understanding the past in that way. And what that means is that history was a great big grab bag, right? It, it wasn't as though people said, well, 200 years ago, this was the case, and 500 years ago, this was the case. It was more like, well, when you look across time at X, you can see this pattern and thus it teaches us. So history as a grab bag is a very enlightenment way of thinking. This was particularly important with the kind of government that the United States launched a democratic republic. And I use those two words really deliberately. A democratic republic. Um, republics, generally speaking, were short-lived. When the founding generation looked back in time, what they saw was that republics collapse and democratic governments usually have major problems. So ancient history had a lot of lessons about what happened to republics and the founding generation thought, okay, if we study these, we will at least have a clue about what to do or not to do or what to put in place or not put in place in some way that might fend off some of that outcome. And, you know, it, it's striking, I should add here, the degree to which, and I'm talking about educated folks here, but the degree to which they really had a familiarity with ancient history because, precisely because it wasn't 
seemingly ancient. It was a part of understanding the present, was understanding the past. If you've ever wondered why um, so many pamphlets and newspaper essays from the time period, you know, have uh, classical pseudonyms, uh, you know, Publius and whatever else it is that they were using, the reason they use those kinds of ancient minded uh, pseudonyms very often is because the assumption was that, of course, the people reading whatever was it was attached to would know. They would know who the person was. They would know what that person symbolized. They would know what historical message was being given by using that name. There was a really um, deep flow of knowledge that we don't have anymore that sort of ran beneath a lot of cultural and historical and political things in the, the founding period. Now, one of my favorite examples of this um, is James Madison, who um, prepared something that he titled um, very sort of modestly, Notes on Ancient and Modern Confederacies. What he wanted to do, uh, and apparently he began this as early as 1784, but it came in um, over time, more useful. Um, he decided he wanted to get every piece of writing he could on um, past and present confederacies, um, saying, quote, the operations of our own, and at that time under the Articles of Confederation, it was a confederacy, the operations of our own must render all such lights of the past of consequence and of the present. So Jefferson at the time uh, was in Europe. Madison said, buy everything, <laughs> buy, buy all the books you can, and then have something to say on confederacies, ancient and modern, and apparently um, in 1786, Madison received two trunks of books from Jefferson. Now that's a good friend, right? Two trunks of books. I mean, just, that makes me, <laughs> this is really off topic. What that makes, put in my mind, those of you who are as old as I probably remember, um, I can't believe I'm going to say this right now. Uh, the kids show Bozo the Clown and there was a big toy box full of toys. And I don't remember what you did, but if you did something, you got the whole toy box full of toys. And to me as a kid, that was like, Wow. So just the, the trunks full of books are basically our equivalent. So anyway, he got these books. He set into reading them and thinking about them. He prepares um, and it is uh, available on the Founders Online um, database, uh, Notes on Ancient and Modern Confederacies by Madison, his notes in which he basically, I mean, it's, uh, this is an exaggeration, but essentially it's like a, a pro and a con column, like what worked, what didn't work, what can we learn? He was really working his way systematically through all these governments to figure the pattern out, the patterns, right? Again, very much of his moment. Um, the, the folks who edited Madison's papers um, thought that he may have been doing that, uh, continuing on with it, thinking about the Annapolis Convention to come. The Annapolis Convention didn't convene for very long. So instead, he ended up using these notes um, at the Constitutional Convention, the Federal Convention, at Virginia's ratifying convention, and particularly as he was penning the Federalist essay. So it came in very useful. Um, and essentially, as I said, to him, it was like a guidebook, you know, that he could have by his side, like, oh, you have a question about representation, flip, 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 flip. This is what history teaches us. He, he was very, very focused on the practical lessons to be learned from history. And the lesson that he took away more than any other, and this is not a surprise, I've probably said it many, many times, is that confederacies were notoriously fragile and basically tended towards dissolution. Um, and thus, he knew from the outset and assumed and worried from the outset, as did many others, including Hamilton, and I've talked about this before, that the American experiment in government might not last, that it might be problematic. Hamilton thought it would be problematic. Madison worried probably would be, but he was a little more optimistic and had slightly different politics from Hamilton. So on the one hand, the founding generation thought about the past in a different way, understood in a pragmatic way, different from ours, um, not just in the fact that we often don't value history, but that even if we did, we wouldn't quite be thinking of it in their way, but they saw it as something that was vital and important and a guide to the present. They also thought about their future in a different way. And this is particularly true of um, 
the politically minded, but also was somewhat broader than that because the fact of the matter is a lot of Americans and not just politically elite Americans assumed, uh, as I've said many times before, that they were engaged in some kind of a political experiment, that they were doing something novel in the modern world. And so what they did mattered. Um, so the founding generation thought about the past and in that sense thought about the future in the sense of what the legacy of some of their actions would be um, about also what posterity would think of them, but they thought about impact in a practical kind of a way. Now, I, I say that and I've written down here on my notes, I'm not saying they're all light and glory. I, I would hold it up, it's in capital letters. Um, so I'm, I'm saying this about them, that they understood the fragility of confederacies, that they were looking forward, that they were thinking about their legacies. Newby has very strong feelings about this too. Um, I'm not saying, ah, oh, the founders, the noble founders who understood everything and did everything in the right frame of mind. I'm not saying that, and I don't think any properly historically minded person would talk about our very human founders uh, who did some things well and some things really not well that way. I think that's irresponsible. Um, but what I am saying is that they had a different understanding of the realities of history and its impact. And again, during times of extreme contingency and the founding is one of them, and we are in one of them, that kind of guidance matters. Right, because I mean, I, I'm sitting here, for example, on a totally different note, but the same principle. I'm not sure how I feel about flying to Seattle. And I'm literally saying to myself, well, I'll wait a day or two for deciding because you never know what's going to happen in the news in an hour or in a day that might help me make up my mind. And that's the world we live in, right? I mean, it's slightly less extreme now that we have a, a new administration, but the fact of the matter still is, we live in times of extreme contingency where to some degree, we really are open to very strange things happening <laughs> in a very short amount of time. Uh, and that certainly puts a lot of strain on us, but I think that that's, that's extreme contingency for you is that we are living with it um, and experiencing it. Now, all of this said, the importance of understanding the past, the importance of history, the importance of the past as a guide. I'm not saying that history repeats. Um, and people love to say that. Um, they will say it, I'm sure, <laughs> for all of time. That's my prediction for the future, that history repeats. Um, it doesn't repeat. Uh, it teaches, occasionally it echoes. Uh, it doesn't repeat. However, it sure as heck matters. Thus the name of this program, right? It matters beyond what I could say week to week. So the reason, one reason uh, that I decided to talk about that this week, particularly as we're getting to the end of a year, is we need to be thinking all the time about how we got here in a broad sense. We need to be looking for broad patterns of what we did in the past. And, and we, with the capital W, so meaning <laughs> Lots of people, right? Americans and others. How we got to this point, what happened that helped lead to this point, and the broad impact of what we do now. You know, I think we have a different sense of time and its passage uh, and history and the future nowadays. I think very often. Um, and this is always to some degree been true uh, of politics but at a time of extreme contingency, it's problematic. Often people in the realm of politics are thinking about the immediate gain, right? The next election, the next outdoor chirp, no, the, the, next, you know, the next immediate contest that must be won. How do we keep power? How do we keep power? Like that's, that's the degree to which people think about posterity. Um, and we are at a moment certainly when people are thinking about that. And it makes sense they're thinking about that. Part of what I'm saying is that if you're thoughtful and responsible and worried about the fate and status of democracy in the United States, you need to think bigger than that. Even if our political leaders, whoever they may be, whatever side you may be on, are not thinking that way. And certainly, um, if you're worried about democracy, you very much need to be focused on the present. <laughs> I will certainly say that. Um, but you also need to be thinking along those lines about the impact, the future impact on what you're doing now. 
In the case of democracy, that does mean act now to preserve it because the future might look different than you expect it to look if you don't. So again, ongoing message. My first History Matters conversation was about contingency. Uh, and that's obviously, it's why it's on every bingo card because it's been a major theme is that unless you understand history, you can't, you have no guidance in contingent times and that history was contingent, that people in the past could not absolutely predict what came next. They were living in the moment, looking forward in time, not backward at their own time. And that we live the same way. We are in the moment looking forward. It's the, it's the logic that guided me with great difficulty in the writing of my last book, The Field of Blood. I was trying to remind myself over and over and over again, I was looking forward in time, not knowing that there would be a civil war. Imagine that, right? As a, as a historian, I don't know that there's a civil war. What if I don't know that there's a civil war? I did that a lot. And I had to because the people I was trying desperately to understand might have been worried about it. And that, that fear might have grown over time. But they didn't know with certainty that that would happen. And that fundamentally shaped everything that they said or did. We don't know what's coming next. And I've said this many times before. That leaves open a lot of different options. One of them may indeed be that we could be headed to a bad place in the future. That must be said. On the other hand, it is also true that in times of extreme contingency, you can have positive change. It's a moment when there's change that is possible to an extreme degree. That can be a good thing. If you see that for what it is, understand that opportunity, protect rights, basic sort of fundamental rights of democracy, and think about ways in which you can better it, strengthen it, think towards the future. So history matters for all of these reasons. But it particularly matters in looking forward in time and our being able to look forward in time in a broader, more thoughtful way than some of our political leading folk might be doing right now. You must worry about the present, but part of the reason why you do that, a big part of that reason is because of what comes next. And we don't know what that will be. And we need to do everything we can to prepare the way for something that helps strengthen people's rights, be more inclusive as a nation, do all of the things that a democratic republic can do better than it is necessarily doing now. We can do that. I still have that kind of faith. Um, I remember there was, when was it? Was it before the last presidential election that I had this like plea for democracy? Um, I believe we can, we can improve things. We can move to a better place, but we can only do that if we do that together deliberately and thoughtfully. So that's really the, the main message of what I'm talking about today. History matters always, but as in the founding, it really matters now in a, in a big way. Um, but there is a third reason why I chose this theme. And now I will confess this. Um, so I was, um, visiting a friend and I was pondering, pondering, pondering what topic. And part of the logic for my topic was, what will be an appropriate topic for Matt's last day <laughs> on History Matters? So, you know, and I cycled through. I was like, um, community. It's like, oh, I can't, I can't. Somehow I couldn't tie that together. Um, I, I, I cycled through a whole bunch of things, trying to come up with a topic that was like, I could have a significant thing to say about history, and then I can yank it around and have something to say about the present that's really important. Not surprisingly, on a webcast called History Matters, <laughs> History Matters was the answer. Um, basically, um, I, I, I'm talking about the history, why history matters matters. <laughs> Um, I, and I might not have even gotten that out the right way, but the, the general point was um, I wanted to talk about and use that idea about why history matters to talk about the history of history matters and why that matters. And a lot of that has to do with my partner in crime, Matt, who has been key in so many ways. Um, he obviously has been, you know, he and I grew into a real team that, you uh, have been working together wonderfully as a team and together with you guys have helped create 
truly an amazing community. I say this all the time. I know it's probably boring, except maybe it feels like self-praise. So you can be like, yes, tell us again. What a wonderful community we are. Um, it really is an amazing community that has persisted, that is strong, that comes together. And we, so many of us know each other um, in a pretty extraordinary way. Uh, it's something that I would not have believed actually one could do with Zoom. And we did it. And Matt was a big part of that. Um, Matt also, in addition to being my partner in crime, has been doing another really historical thing. And that is offspring background. <laughs> Very historical, the background. So uh, he has been contributing in multiple ways historically to our understanding of history. He's been amazing at translating, corralling, uh, and nudging you for questions. So he's been a vital translator in basically helping our community to engage in conversation. The after party background, man, where would we be without that? Vital. And thus to helping us have the after party, which is like an extra added bonus thing about our community is that after the history part, and I've said this before, I know, I brag all the time about the fact that these people come every week they listen to me talk for a half hour. We have another half hour where we discuss and have questions. And then another half hour when we just talk. Um, that's, that's 90 minutes. That's a significant chunk of time. That's a sign of a community. So anyway, um, I wanna uh, salute Matt. Um, first of all, I don't know how to do this, but um, let's see here, wait a minute. Can I do this? Uh, no, I don't wanna raise my hand. I wanna applaud. I don't know how. Uh, you guys can know how to do this. I was gonna like do the little applause symbol and I don't know how to do it. Um, can I do it? No, okay, I don't know how, but you guys probably can. Um, I wanna salute Matt. I want us, if there's a way to do this and I'm so technologically not savvy um, to applaud uh, Matt. Um, and I just thank you for um, helping me being part of us to create um, what we did and making it so much fun. We really work well together. And um, two things I want to show you. One is of course, the mug question, my partner in crime. Don't look emotional, Matt, or I'm gonna cry. I can't hear you, but don't, cannot. That's, that's why I had the video off, so. Good. Okay, good. Cause, cause if, if, I, if I see any, any, yeah, I'm, I'm the easiest crier in the universe. Um, anyway, so the mug I picked, uh, it, it in its way, and some of you might not know of it. Uh, okay, there I see people applauding. Thank you. It is it is a um, a salute to Matt. Um, it's the pomp and crest for the door mug. Now, to explain this for those of you who don't know what it is, um, when I talked about women in politics in this time period, I. I read aloud part of a satirical newspaper account um, pretending as though, and Matt, you have the name down, I always forget it, Roxana? Wilhelmina. Roxana, Roxana, Roxana Wilhelmina Pompencrest. Pompencrest. Now that a great name. It was a satirical piece saying that this woman, Roxana Wilhelmina Pompencrest was running for doorman uh, of the House of Congress and why she was so entitled to be doorman. And it was, you know, I'm tall and my hair is big and I have very big costumes. It was making fun of the idea, heaven forbid. And um, Matt is one of the people who truly seized control of this and became for a little while on Twitter. That was one of your persona. On yes, that was, that was my alter ego for a while. It yeah. was your alter ego for a while. So in my mind, and this is a, this is a Matt mug, <laughs> which is why I went to find it. And I will also, um, I found a tweet uh, from Pomp and Crest, who I know is no longer on Twitter because, you know, <laughs> he had other places to go and you have other persona. But I did find a newbie tweet, which enables him to pipe in too. Newbie's tweet says, <laughs> and it's from November 24th of last year. Oodly, oodly, oo. Poppincrest said on the Woody Allen of birds. <laughs> I forgot I said that. <laughs> I accept. Oodly oi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Oh, newbie. newbie had to pipe in too. And yeah, now you're quiet. 
<laughs> and I know he was he was so loud at the, at the beginning. He was, he was, he was. Uh, um, okay. Anyway. Uh so that's an honor of you. And now oh, thank you. The background. Yes, so the background, and you know, most everybody got it. It's a more obvious one. I went with a little more obvious, but the reason why, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this is actually Jimmy Fallon's uh, uh, Tonight Show, um, only because this picture was better than the Johnny Carson ones, which is the ones I was really looking for, um, because that's what I thought it was. It, it, it is. It is the Tonight Show, and I, and I did so because. Um, I will for it has been an honor and a joy to be your Ed McMahon for all of this, all of this time and to get to be a part of hearing your genius um, and your and everything that you give to this community. And uh, so I went with the Tonight Show because I will forever and all always want to be your Ed McMahon. So. Aww. Thank you. Okay, now you now you've gone and done it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> quick break. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that that is. I'll do jazz good. hands. Jazz hands, while we wait. <laughs> Matt, jazz hands. <laughs> Matt, jazz hands. Yeah. Um, well, you were you were valued even more than an Ed McMahon. Um, my, see, when I think of Ed McMahon, what I think of is, ho, 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 ho yeah. Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or Publishers Clearing House, that's the other thing. Yes, yep. <laughs> so yep. anyway, yeah, right. So now we're all going to, okay. Okay, <laughs> everybody take deep breaths. And then we have like yes. legit questions here. Yes, and... I was going to say, we can, we can, we have things we can discuss here. Yes. All right. So let me open questions here. Um, Matt McMahon says Beth. <laughs> Matt McMahon. <laughs> um, oh, Dave, great. This is a good way to start. Uh, given what historians know in 2021 about how republics, confederacies, and democracies work or don't work, what amendments seem overdue to the U.S. Constitution? Wow. In your That's mind. That's a big question. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I can answer it in, um, I don't want to say a superficial way, but a not deeply considered because I would want to think for a long time about this way. But um, obviously, and this is um, not going to be something new, sure seems like we need to think about the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. That was one he recommended. So that was, that was, he asked specifically I mean, about that know, one. That seems to be a thing we should think about in a mm -hmm. big way. Um, again, I, I'm not against, I'm certainly not against amending the constitution that that's part of the process. It's right there in the constitution. Newbie is like vanishing out of the screen. <laughs> Noob. <laughs> He's a, um, it's like, no, 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 I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to go over here and <laughs> you. thank you. I've had my say. I'm just going <laughs> to, he just showing us his butt basically. <laughs> um, that's what he has to say about the electrical. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think that's one thing. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, you know, I feel as though um, I would not say that every violated norm needs an amendment, and there have been a lot of violated norms. Um, I would say that um, there are some rights that have been routinely violated, voting rights is one, that certainly needs legislation, but there might be other ways in which rights could be protected. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but we're living in a time where we're learning ways in which in the modern sort of 21st century things can still be um, tweaked as being polite uh, to serve some and exclude others. Um, the easy answer, I think, is the Electoral College. I, I, I will admit that um, I become anxious about changing the fundamental things about the Constitution just because I'm a historian and mm -hmm. it's the Constitution. Um, but I would totally be open to, to seeing serious debate from posterity-minded people uh, who are act actually willing to think about the broader picture of what they were doing in amending or, you know, in some way other changing the Constitution. That's the thing, right? That's the caveat, is mm -hmm. that um, people who are going to do that kind of fundamental work, at least some of them need to be 
broad-minded and think beyond party. So that's that's pretty much. What no, that's that's. So there's kind of two directions we could go there, and I'll let you sort of think about it. But um, you know, we eliminated the electoral college for senators, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's not like it hasn't been done in the past. You know what I mean? So that that could be one avenue we could talk a little bit more about. But I think the other one actually is maybe a little more germane to our conversation today, which. And I will get back to other questions, I promise, but I'm going to hijack the hell out of this today. So you could do whatever the heck you want. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, no, nobody's pulling me off the stage with a cane today. So no, um, no, but this is, I guess my, my, my question, because as I was listening to talk, this idea of our founders being really aware of posterity and their place in history. And I think that, um, American presidents um, in the last forever, um, even you know ones I fundamentally disagree with, have been acutely aware of their place in history um, for the most part, with I think one notable exception. Um, but I wondered, who are the people that you see in the political arena today, like 2021, that may be more posterity minded? than others. Wow. Uh, I don't think I even know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, um, we can all think of people who we would say are not posterity minded. Right. Um, but I think, I think I might not answer that question only because uh, I don't know if I want to be that specific. Mm -hmm. But what I will say in response to that question though is, um, it is true that in past generations, many presidents were posterity minded, future minded, but I will also say that since the very beginning, um, even before we had um, formal parties, it was unclear. People were not sure how to balance political loyalties and uh, immediate politics. And by that, I, the example of that is, um, it's a letter I found a long time ago uh, written between two people, someone in the first Congress to someone, a friend or vice versa. Um, it was part of the great first Congress project at GW. And the letter was um, talking about um, John Adams as vice president. And it was something like, you know, this guy, John Adams, I mean, he like, he, he does and says like, things that like sometimes I agree with them and sometimes I don't and he's not always agreeing with the people who are his friends and you know it was this long sort of why is he only doing what he thinks and not ever joining in reliably with anybody else and the person who responded said isn't that what he's supposed to be doing <laughs> <laughs> isn't he supposed to be just kind of considering for himself what he wants to do. And that, that you know, that's really, really early on. That, of course, John Adams is always that guy. So is John Quincy Adams. And that's why they're the one-term presidents, mm -hmm. right? Because they did not play by clear party lines mm -hmm. and they did not get reelected. But that, the, the uh, anecdote I just mentioned goes all the way back. So even before there were parties, there's some assumption that like, well, you must join in league with your friends to do what you want to do. And, and if you don't, you're being a bad politician, except you're in a republic, particularly, you're supposed to be independent minded. And if, if you're a representative acting on behalf of your constituents, right, you're supposed to be able to think that way. So um, it's always been something that's, that's perplexing, I think, about um, representative government and democratic governance. I'm going to, I'm going to add one more question to this and feel free to totally reject it if you don't want to answer it, but uh, historically, especially the founding era and probably leading into the civil war, which I know is also your other area of expertise. Um, who had posterity more in ingrained folks that are traditionally assumed to be part of the executive branch or folks that are more assumed to be part of the legislative branch. You mean just generally across Just time? generally speaking, like, you know, when you think of people that are like thinking about the future of the Republic, would you say that's more folks like 
Hamilton, Washington, Jefferson, you know, some of those folks, or would you say that it is um, the folks that came out of the legislative branch? Well, I, I mean, I can tell you um, what the founder folk might have said in answer mm -hmm. to that. So, and I, I mentioned this really briefly in the, my most recent um, op-ed, uh, and that is um, they initially in the Constitutional Convention, the Federal Convention, uh, there was some, they were nervous for obvious reasons about giving uh, executive power to a single person, like one, a single man president mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons, right? Like we've just broken away from a king that didn't work out so well. We're worried about power, we're worried about executive power, worried about tyranny. All of these reasons made it obvious to worry about giving too much power to one person. Mm -hmm. So there was discussion of a, a kind of executive council of like a couple of people, right? Men, three men say, and one of the arguments against that was if there are three men, they can hide behind each other and do whatever the heck they want because they won't necessarily be noticed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there's one person, he, and at the time it's only he, will be responsible for his actions. So he will have to think about their impact. So part of my answer to your question is presidents in some ways have to think that way because they are one person who's gonna be held responsible. And even if they're just thinking about posterity for purely selfish reasons, they are aware in some ways that what they do um, is, might be, or usually is attached to them. It becomes a tin can dragging mm -hmm. after their reputation. Um, you know, as far as uh, Congress goes, um, you know, if you're, it's harder to say, right? I mean, on the one hand, you might say in Congress, uh, that it would be it would be wonderful to be able to say that in Congress, if you think really about posterity and legacies, the public will support you, and that's probably not necessarily true, right? That, that people mm -hmm. put you into office because they have um, needs and demands and assumptions about what they want, and that's a more immediate kind of post. And it, you know, particularly in the House, you know, shorter terms, you you could argue that uh, particularly the House, but Congress generally has a different, slightly different logic behind mm -hmm. it. Um, I also think that I'm making pontificating here, but the fact of the matter is that the presidency has changed over time in a lot of ways and become more powerful than it was. So you could answer this in a lot of different ways, but that, yeah, that that's kind of, that's, point. that's kind of where I was coming from is, you know, we were designed intentionally to have a weak executive, at least in the, in, or a weaker executive. Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't say weak, but weaker executive. Um, but historically that you know we remember the i think the executive probably more but you're right it's because there is one person they can't hide right although you know um and i've written about this before too um in the 19th century certainly um up through the part of the first half of it congress was at the center of all the news mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't so much the president and if you looked at a typical newspaper from the time the, the majority of column inches were devoted to Congress. There would be these large synopses of the mm -hmm. debates in Congress. And then there would be a sort of your man on the spot kind of summing up of what was happening in Congress. Mm -hmm. And to an extreme degree, like all the news was, was Congress. So it, that's foreign, very foreign to us uh, and even the semi-recent past, but um, that was very much the case for a chunk of the 19th century. Well, we only have 11 minutes left, so I will turn this back to our, our questions from the peanut gallery, um, starting with James, uh, kind of sw switching gears a little bit here. He asks, is it even possible to be an effective amateur historian? Isn't it only in rigorous study where history can be invoked, balanced, and precisely with less risk of myopicism? Interesting, wow. Well, small um, questions today. Really narrow, well, <laughs> narrowly focused, yeah, easy to answer. Poof. Um, I think I think I'll be a historian and answer that. That's complicated. Um, no, it, it. I think there are a number of ways in which you can answer that. I think. Um, uh, oh, I will see. Uh, Tim is is uh, has on chat um, a poem that someone wrote about John Adams as vice president. If you want to go, it's a goofy poem. But as far as history. Um, I think, you know, historians who are trained as historians, um, part of that training is um, 
understanding the big picture, understanding how to evaluate different kinds of evidence, understanding the implications of different forms of evidence. Like there's all kinds of like, there's a toolbox you get when mm -hmm. you get trained as a historian um, that you don't necessarily have when you're not trained as a historian. Now that said, I think, um, and Jefferson would agree with me, right? Jefferson believed that um, Americans generally needed to know history, that you know there should be three years of schooling, uh, particularly for white men, uh, and they should learn, people should learn history because you would not understand what your country was or what your government was and what threats to it were unless you understood history in some way. So the assumption was, you know, history, like many people can study history and understand it. Um, even historians have profound disagreement. So it's not as though historians will come up with the right answer right. and others won't. You know, I mean, I, there are lots of historians that I think, you know, harumph, uh, I, don't, I don't think that person, you know, um, but I do think historians typically have a, what's the word I'm looking for? They expect more of each other because of that toolbox. And if you don't use it or misuse it, you're called on it mm -hmm. as a historian. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but. Um, no, I think that gets there. That's, it's, it's important. It actually uh, balances with um, a question Vicki had. Um, she she asks on 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 the topic of history education in K twelve schools specifically because you mentioned that as you were speaking. Um, there are those who say the purpose of history education is to instill pride in America, and therefore discussing all the bad stuff is wrong. Uh, what what is your rebuttal to that? What um, or um, apparently there's someone named Ender's Game. Uh, yeah. In uh, who is being unpleasant. Uh, but anyway, go, on, go ahead with your question. No, it's fine. That, yes, we got, apparently we got our first troll in a very long time, which is- I know, it's been a while. It's been a long time. And I, I honestly, just to say out loud, I think I would, I'd be more impressed if it were um, Demosthenes rather than Ender's Game. And those of you who've read Ender's Game will get that reference, so. But, um, so so Vicky was asking about this, I, I, I you, you talked about the the idea that our founders believe that they should be that we that learning history should be part of our schools, but that um, what you learn, you know, the kind of tools that historians have may be different than what um, students might have. Uh, Vicky is asking about K twelve schools, who says and says the. Um, there are folks that say that the purpose of history education is to instill pride in America. Um, what's your comment on that? Uh, is that the purpose or is it something else or? I think the purpose of history education is to understand, um, particularly if you talk about American history, is to understand your country as close as you could get to in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just a matter of pride. That's a matter of understanding. And yeah. there are things to be proud of and there are things not to be proud of. And that's a fact. Um, and that's true of everything and, and any country. There's, there is no country that's like, I'm only gonna learn the proud parts. And that if you do that, you somehow will magically understand the country. That does a disservice to the understanding of history and to all of the people in that history working and fighting and conflicting and thinking and clashing and, and you know all of the stuff that goes into the making of events over time, they're not living in a world where everyone's sort of happy and proud. History is made up of clashing and conflict and contingency, <laughs> threats, several Cs. History is made up of all of those things. And you can't, it just gets right back to what I was talking about. You can't understand the present in its entirety, in its complexity, with the good and the bad, with people who are being served well at the moment and people who are not, with the vulnerabilities of our government, with all of the ways in which we can be better. We can't move there unless we understand all of the ways in which we got here. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine being at this moment in time and pretending as though racism has never been a problem in America. Right. I'm sorry, but that's nonsense. Um, that's beyond nonsense. So yeah, you can claim that and say, oh, you know, no one should ever feel uncomfortable looking at history 
and no one should ever acknowledge anything bad about the past. Um, but that's not going to serve anyone. It's not going to serve the country. It's not going to serve students. It's not going to serve the future. And it's pretending that the past doesn't exist. Um, you know, when I look back at my life, I can see the places where I did some pretty dumb things, right? I can, I can look back and say, like, this was a good decision. I don't admire this moment in my life, right? I wish I didn't do this, or I wish I did do this, or whatever. We are all that, right? We are all the sum total of the things we're proud of and the things that we're really not proud of. And in some cases, maybe even things that we feel profoundly problematic about. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can understand yourself at this moment unless you've got both of those things in your mind. If you are only owning the like, oh, I'm smiling and perfect all the time, right? The other part's still there. You're just pretending it's not there and anybody else, <laughs> <laughs> they potentially can see it. So, um, you know, it doesn't take a historian to be able to say that um, history is complicated, it's good and bad, and it's not meant to make us comfortable. Right. It's meant to make us thoughtful. It's meant to make us have a deeper understanding of where we are. It's meant to have us better understand ourselves and our place in the world. You, do, you don't get any of those things unless you look at history in its entirety, in its complexity, and ask hard questions. And that's what teachers are there for, is to help people ask important questions, often hard questions, and then offer information so students can think about the answers and decide for themselves how they want to understand the past. That those are all, you know, that's not that's not like crazy Joanne. Like that's you know, that's just that's just a fact. Um, so that's that's my long-winded answer to that. I, yeah, I, I agree, and, I, and that's why I, I wanted. I, I think it's important to reiterate these things, even though you know that's. Uh, I think your answer is spot on and. Um, reflects the last 89 weeks or whatever it's been that we've that we've been talking um so i, I you know I, I think it's i think it's fantastic um but i do want to say just to add to that my my own personal sort of thought is i'm consistently floored by people who believe that seeing like seeing the things that are quote unquote not not good um somehow diminishes your pride in your in your analogy in yourself or your country or your state or your school or whatever you know like I mean like that the, those are not mutually you know those those have to be mutually exclusive or something like I, I don't I, I've never understood that and I think it's it's worth noting that well and I've I've quoted and maybe done it very recently so forgive me if I have but I've quoted John Adams on this before mm -hmm. that um in his his senior post-presidential years, um, like, like a good number of founder folk, um, people would uh, write to him. I was about to say email him. <laughs> people, people would write to him, wow, um, and, and ask him like, oh, tell us great founder about the glories of what you did. Yeah. And over and over and over again, Adams would be like, look, we didn't know what we were doing. We made mistakes. I think I did mention last week, maybe that I saw the faces of people as they signed the Declaration of Independence. There were a lot of people who were unhappy. There's one letter in which he says something, and this is going to be a bad paraphrase. He's like, we made mistakes. We made mistakes in 1775, 76, 77, mm -hmm. 78. And he just like, <laughs> just making a point. Um, they didn't think they were perfect. So anyone who's claiming that now is making stuff up. Mm -hmm. If you ask John Adams, he would tell you you were speaking nonsense. <laughs> really tell you that. He's the guy who likes pricking every balloon, you know, just like his son, John Quincy, right? It's like, oh, please, like you, you think this. We all know. You know he's that guy. So, yeah. Well, I think that, that this all leads nicely into the last question I want to ask, which is from Greg. I'm going to read it and then I'm, I might say something about it. So just forewarning, which is uh, okay. the... The, the question is, um, would the importance of history in the United States be more greatly appreciated if civics were still taught as part of the core curriculum? And so just to turn that a little bit into something more conceptual that you might wanna sort of explore is, what do you think the relationship between history and civics is and should be? Well, okay, so whenever I see that question discussed in a public-minded way, 
I see some people saying, yes, we need more civics education and others saying we're still like there are those of us out here teaching that basically. So the ideas of it have not been fully abandoned. And, and so they're angry teachers saying, yo, you know, <laughs> so um, I do think that it's pretty vitally important for people to have a really fundamental understanding of how the government works, how it's structured, what the constitution is. You know, I, I was talking with a friend a day or two ago about how many people think the Bill of Rights is the constitution, like that's it. Like mm -hmm. they don't actually realize the rest of it's out there. People need to have that kind of fundamental understanding. They need to understand voting and its history and why it's important. They need to understand the rights of being an American citizen. They need all of these things. And I understand that the umbrella of civics sort of ties them all up. However, people learn that they need to know that. Um, and I don't know the proper way to do that. And I know that already some students are learning this and that there are people out there really doing hard work on that that deserve to be credited for that. So I, I won't absolutely answer that. I just will say, wow, I'm agreeing with Thomas Jefferson. Um, <laughs> you gotta know that stuff. You, you, you can't be a good citizen if you don't understand your government and know what citizenship means. Mm -hmm. You just can't. And, and things will happen and you won't understand the ways in which they are violating your rights. If you don't know your rights, you don't know how the government works and you don't know the ways in which you can constitutionally demand your rights. At, at, all of those things are pretty basic. And that's, you know, um, monarchies rely on a monarch and um, more democratic modes of government rely on the people. And the people need to understand what that means. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's a good way to end, but I, I would do have one more question, which has nothing to do with anything that we've talked about today. But Tom, Tom asks, in honor of my last show, can Joanne tell the gay history story one last time? Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> jazz hands. Jazz hands. Okay. Jazz hands. Jazz hands. I can I can tell the gay history story one last time. It's actually and it, it's a pandemic story. Mm -hmm. Um. So the gay history story is. Um. I went out with a friend to get ice cream uh, and everyone was masked. But of course I had my mask off because I had ice cream. Uh, and we were walking down Columbus Avenue and someone walked past me the other direction. And as they went past, she said, and it was a woman, yay, history. <laughs> <laughs> and I was with a friend and I like looked at her and then I turned around and the person was looking back and she said, yay, history. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you lady, you. And I didn't like, clearly she knew who I was uh -huh. and, and had like the, the, you know, in that moment said, yay, history. I didn't know why, but it was like, it was the best. Yeah. I mean, I mean for all, not just because like, ooh, she recognized me, but what a great thing, right? To know that like, whatever it is you're doing about history, like it got out there and someone is listening and there they are. That's the, that's the yay history story. Um, at the time, I thought it was really funny because I, I think people were still talking about the fact that um, someone saw Lin-Manuel Miranda and said, yay, Hamlet, instead of Hamilton, because they forgot that. <laughs> oh, I was like, well, I got my own moment now. <laughs> yay history. But that's that's the, the yay history moment. That's a different mug. Uh, it is. It is a different mug that I believe, thanks to Kara Lee, um, but th that is indeed the, the yay history story. Whoever that anonymous person is, and I don't know who she was, and I even like tried to go out into the social media sphere and say, like, if, are you out there? Yay history. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's right. Yay. Uh, Tim has it right. Yay history. Yay, Matt. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I will turn it over to you to say our goodbyes, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, NCHE. Thank you um joanne for your kindness your thoughtfulness and these fridays have meant the world to me so thank you okay um i will as always uh sign off um so uh, first off uh, i will note um to people that uh, as always every week um we will now head into the after party um what that means is that we stop recording uh, so that we can be a little freer and easier in our conversation. 
Uh, and so if you have beamed in through the CHE website or the link that led through that website, um, stay right where you are. And someone that's gotta be on the bingo card, poof, we will become the after party. If you are watching this on Facebook, you will need to leave Facebook and join us at nchetech.org slash conversations. And then you can join the after party. Before the after party, um, I do want to say, as I do always say, thank you, all of you, for coming here every week to engage in democracy, to have these kinds of conversations about things that matter in a public mode, uh, and occasionally for better and worse. Uh, but usually almost all the time for better. Um, it's so important to have these kinds of conversations. It's still so important to talk and ask and answer questions. It matters in more ways than we know. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, and I, as always, will say I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, the, the next two episodes, I believe, are going to be pre-recorded because we're getting into Christmas New Year's mode. But there will be episodes. So they will be there. We will not miss a week. Not after 89 or 90 or however many weeks, we will not miss a week. Um, so that I will all say. And then um, last but not least, Matt, thank you so much. This has been the best. And I know a lot of people have said to me that this um, got them through the pandemic. Um, it got me through the pandemic too. Me too. And a big part of that is because of you. No, well, that has everything to do with you. So thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, on that side. Everybody note. jazz hands and let's hit stop. I, I, yeah, we need some jazz hands in the after party, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's Grace. We cannot hear you, Grace. Yeah, that makes total sense. <laughs> just, just to give Joanne a moment to recover again, thank you, Matt, on behalf of NCHE, uh, live and recorded here. Thank you for everything you've done for this community. It has been remarkable. And now I will take us off Facebook and we will stop recording. <laughs>